everyone. Welcome to this informal conversation recorded for Arbitration Channel on this Friday, November 17th, here in New York City on the occasion of the last day of New York Arbitration Week, which celebrates the fifth anniversary of, of the Arbitration Week. And uh, to take advantage of the fact that we are all here gathered in the greatest city in the world, we um, we're going to discuss or talk a little bit about the practical aspects of an arbitration hearing. Um, and you're going to hear from a mix of Brazilian, U.S., and U.K. practitioners. We have here today, on starting from my far left, Gabriel Seijo, who is a partner at Sescomba here in Brazil and um, divides his time between their Salvador and Sao Paulo offices. Then we have Mark McNeil, who is a partner at King Quinn Emanuel and heads the firm's international arbitration practice in New York. Paulo Macedo, who is also a partner at Sescom Barrio in Sao Paulo and is part of the firm's dispute resolution and mediation practice group. And on my far right, we have Michael Young Q Casey, who is a partner at Quinn Emanuel and divides his time between Quinn Emanuel's New York and Paris offices. And I'm Lija Hezengi, and I'm an associate at Chaffetz Lindsay here in New York. And as I mentioned, our, our topic today is, our goal today is to discuss the practical aspects of an arbitration hearing. And, um, you know, before we jump into the practical aspects, I want to start with a simple question, which is, what is the purpose of a hearing on the merits in international arbitration? And uh, we'll go with Mark. Sure. <laughs> do I need the microphone? Oh, yes, you do. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I guess you're taking first from the perspective of the tribunal, what is the purpose of a merits hearing? And uh, first of all, it's to give the parties a fair opportunity to present their evidence and present their case, right? And the tribunal is always thinking about making sure that it, that it issues an award that is uh, going to be upheld and that they aren't going to be subject to any um, accusations that there were any due process issues, right? So to have a fair hearing in which both sides have an opportunity. Uh, it's also obviously to to um, learn about the facts and the law that are necessary to decide the claims and to write uh, an award. So the tribunal has in its mind, its primary task is going to be writing an award. What do I need to do that? Um, I would say a th third point might be testing the evidence. That's something that usually happens through the adversarial system, right? So that primarily takes care of each side, tests the other side's mm -hmm. evidence. But sometimes you'll have on cross-examination, you know, the, the, the lawyer who is sort of dancing around the main topic, is afraid to ask the ultimate question because they, they're not going to like the answer. That may be where the tribunal needs to step in and get the full answer, right? And understand the lawyer may not like it. Uh, but get the full answer and, and make sure that the evidence is fully tested and that the proposition is fully put to, to the witness. You also may have a, an imbalance between the lawyers sometimes on, on one side or the other, and the tribunal may need to sort of artfully you know, make sure that there is a little more of a balance and that, that both sides are being tested. Um, then you have from the lawyer's perspective, of course, you know, and maybe I'll leave that to someone else to, to, to cover so I don't hog the, the microphone. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Thank you, you all from Queen Emmanuel, Mark and Michael and Andrea Monteiro, who is uh, from the UK and organized all of that. So it's it's very good to be here in New York. And I, I think from the lawyer's perspective, well, of course, first of all, you want to be uh, compelling about your arguments. You want to bring to the arbitrators the best of your case and to give uh, a What's, what are the main perspectives of the case that uh, you want to uh, point out to the arbitrators? Uh, particularly in cases where you have like a bunch of documents, sometimes thousands of documents that we have in our case. Uh, even though we don't have discovery in Brazil, like doc particularly in arbitrations when you have like infrastructure case and uh, energy case, when, when you have like a very uh, intense uh, production of evidence, uh, it's very important to point out to the arbitrator what is the rights and important documents uh, around all of those documents to 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 show uh, why where is your, your case based on 
And so it, th that's, I think it's, of course, uh, uh, the main uh, purpose of the, the hearing, to point out what's the most relevant part, parts of the case uh, in the middle of all those documents that were brought by both parties. Can I just add something? Because, in fact, I wrote down test the evidence when you wrote that question. Um, and my instinctive, sort of classically common law reaction is, is that perhaps the most important thing in any hearing for me is the opportunity to test the evidence. But um, Mark mentioned the, I suppose, the perspective of counsel. And we haven't touched on it yet, but for me, one of the main advantages or one of the main roles served by a hearing is it's a rare opportunity to have real-time reactions from the tribunal on both the evidence and the arguments. You can sense where you may need to focus, areas that they're interested in, areas they're not interested in, areas where you think you're doing well, areas you think you're doing badly. Because it's hard for one person to have a poker face throughout the course of a hearing. It's impossible for three people to have a poker face throughout the course of a hearing. Um, and also as part of that, to understand the dynamic between the tribunal as well, which can often manifest itself in the middle of a hearing, uh, which can be useful strategically, not least when you then develop the post-hearing submissions. Definitely, that's, that's a good point. Gabriel, do you have anything to add? I think that, uh, first of all, First of all, thank you very much for Queen Emmanuel for having us here. Thank you very much for, for uh, to Lydia for running the show today. Um, and uh, I think that from uh, the lawyer's perspective, maybe the hearing is the most important event of the whole uh, arbitral proceedings. Uh, not only for all the things that were said here today, and I totally subscribe them, but uh, we have this uh, opportunity of organizing our claims, our requests, in a relatively short period of time and see the immediate reaction, as Michael said. And uh, I think that at a good hearing, we are able to uh, eliminate the doubts the arbitrators may have and sometimes adjust the case to what happens there. Thank you. Perfect. So... With that in mind, with the purpose of the hearing in mind, let's, uh, we're, we're going to move forward and address, address four topics here today. And the first topic is opening and closing statements. And I'll start again with a simple question. What, what is your, the purpose of op an opening statement, uh, Paulo? Yes, well, thank you. Uh, the main parts, well, one of the main parts of uh, the hearing, from, at least from the lawyer's perspective, uh, is uh, the, the opening uh, uh, oral arguments. And because there, it's, uh, of course, when you are producing evidence like crossing, examining witness, this is very important as well, but uh, the opening of uh, an arbitration hearing is the very uh, precise moments when you have full attention from the arbitrators. It's the moment where everybody is uh, rested, Everybody is really paying attention to the case. Everybody is looking forward to receive uh, uh, information. So, uh, for at least for a Brazilian lawyer uh, perspective, I would say that uh, uh, this uh, time is one of the most critical moments, and that's why you need to take care precisely what what's being brought to the presentation, to the PPT presentation, what documents you are referring to. And of course, it, it, it's uh, very different when you go from one jurisdiction to another, and when, particularly when you go from one uh, uh, group of arbitrators to other groups of arbitrators. Like, uh, uh, what I'm saying here is definitely uh, what we see mostly when we're uh, before uh, an arbitral tribunal, but it, when you go, uh, I had the experience to, to go to, to see other arbitrations, arbitrators from other jurisdictions, and it's not the same. I had uh, an uh, opportunity to, to be in a, in a case in the UK, and then uh, the, the arbitrator was like a very senior uh, a guy, that like a, uh, and then uh, when we were preparing our PPTs, we had something in mind, and we studied the, 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 this arbitrator, but then we got there, like everything, went in a different direct like, the direction. Like uh, we, uh, we uh, the PPT presentation, for example, was not compiling at all. 
because, uh, for example, these styles. When you, uh, in Brazil, you, you go through the presentation and you point out what are the documents, but in a very, it's smooth, but you, you don't spend like too much time in just one document because like it, you, you need to get uh, uh, the whole case in, in, in a, this short period. Uh, but then uh, there, in this experience that I'm talking about in UK, the arbitrator wanted to see the document in detail as he was seeing the document for the first time. Of course, it was not the first time he was seeing the document, but he wanted to go line by line. And I had the time to speak, so I, I needed to cut all of my other arguments because I, I, wasn't, I didn't see that coming. So uh, it... It's, you need to be prepared for that and you need to change uh, your approach and your strategic when you are, you, you are before this, this difference. And of course, you need to be uh, surrounded for lawyers uh, from uh, each jurisdiction that you are, uh, you are in front of to, to be uh, more prepared to deal with any, any kind of different approach that uh, you will you, you'll be seeing. So the focus of the discussion here, I think um, there has been some debate on how useful opening statements are and how long they should be and the format that they should be. In, a, in a, one of the Kanauji arbitrage events just last week, we had um, arbitrators saying that they don't think it's useful anymore to have PowerPoints that summarize the entire, all of the past submissions because it assumes the arbitrators are not reading the past <coughs> submissions when they should have been. Uh, and, and I wonder, and that's my question to, to the panelists, whether that is something that derives from cultural differences or, or the type of case. How do you decide what to do in your opening statement? How do you decide if you're going to have a long PowerPoint or if you're going to have just a skeleton arguments and focus on, on um, a few documents? And I'll, I'll um, Michael. This question? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, for, for me, opening oral opening submissions are very important, um, much more important than closing, which I know we'll get to in a moment, um, because they have that wonderful, as I mentioned in response to the earlier question, that chance to have that first reaction in real time with the tribunal. Um, but I think certain rules need to be followed, because if you asked, as you, as you mentioned in your first question, Lydia, what is the purpose of an oral opening submission? It's essentially, it's a roadmap. And you know, mixing my uh, description there, it's, it's a, a roadmap or a checklist, a checklist for success on your case theory. But it can't be long. Uh, for my money, I don't think any oral opening submission should be longer than 90 minutes. I am not a fan of PowerPoint at all unless you have one or two demonstrative style slides which can help convey quite a complex issue in an illustrative form. But the problem with PowerPoint, and this is, I know, cheap pop psychology, but I'm guilty of it as well. If you're looking at a PowerPoint, you're just looking at the words and not hearing the words. And you're also not making notes because it's that perfect combination of sight, sound, and action <laughs> that means that people remember things. So I'm not a huge fan of, of PowerPoints. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I really change, maybe this is my fault uh, or my, my, my problem. I don't change the method of delivering an opening submission according to the tribunal, because I think if you have a system which you believe works, it should work irrespective of the cultural background, irrespective of the backgrounds of, of, the, of the tribunal. Because if it's a straightforward, structured, clear exposition of the key elements of your case, then that should work for anybody. Um, there are a few things I think you should avoid, uh, in, in, at least in my experience too, is it's always tempting to over-egg your case. Um, or do the thing which you should never do, of course, which is you will hear from X, Y. And of course, when X gives evidence, you don't hear Y at all, or quite the opposite of Y. And equally, I think it's tempting to try and steer away from some of the difficulties in your case. Um, but it's always one of those sort of great cliches of trial preparation when you give for students is that it's all, every single case is about doing two things. It's either 
maximizing a good case theory or minimizing a bad one. And you have to focus as much on the latter as the former and to draw some of the poison that you know will be coming out of the mouths of your colleague, uh, especially if you're going first. So I think there are various things you can do, but the simple thing is just short, to the point, and structured. It should work for anyone, irrespective of their background. Any conflicting views or agreeing views on this side of the table? Gabriel? Actually, uh, most agreeing views. <laughs> um, I use PowerPoint, uh, but uh, I try not to have too much text on it. Uh, I use PowerPoint just as a matter of having a guideline for my presentation so that if the arbitrators get at some point distracted, they know what I'm talking about. That's all. Uh, and of course, sometimes we use PowerPoint to emphasize some document, project a document, and so on. But uh, PowerPoint could be very distractive. So uh, we should avoid many images, texts, and so on. Otherwise, the arbitrators will spend the whole presentation just trying to read what's on screen. And sometimes you pass the slide, so you need to go back because the arbitration, arbitrator failed to read everything. So it's a tricky uh, tool. And uh, we, I use them. Uh, actually, in Brazilian practice, I think everyone does this. But uh, we should be very, um, we should have parsimony in the use of it. Uh, just briefly, to your question, uh, Lydia, about whether there are cultural differences, I think there are also individual differences, and I think to the extent you can know your tribunal. There are some tribunals that are fiercely proud of the fact that they come extremely well prepared to the tribunal, and they don't want to hear regurgitation of your entire case. They want to hear the issues which are agreed by the parties, the points of difference between the parties that they can identify and decide, ah, that's what we need to decide on that issue. Uh, and a roadmap to to the uh, the witness testimony and the expert testimony they're going to hear. Now, of course, you want to explain why your witnesses and why your experts are more credible and what you're going to hear from them and, what, and why you should prefer that testimony over the other side. But know your tribunal and then read your tribunal as you're going along. And this was Michael's point, too. You get so much feedback from the tribunal. Sometimes it's just facial, but you really, you know, there'll be an eye roll or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and really, um, you know, react to that. I think a lot of lawyers just look at their text and just keep steaming forward and don't realize. I also like to invite the tribunal to ask questions, right? Even pause and just say, invite them, even in mid, sometimes the tribunals tend to be too uh, um, uh, hesitant to interrupt uh, the, the presentations. It depends upon their style and their personalities, of course. So I like to sometimes invite questions because the questions from the tribunal give you enormous insight into what they're thinking, what they're grappling with, and allow you then to refocus your case or hone your case more on what they're doing. In terms of PowerPoint, I, I am guilty of using them, but I share the same deep <laughs> reservations that, that Gabrielle and Michael have. I like using visuals in the more, more than text when, whenever yeah. possible. Uh, sometimes can bring bring some something to life visually, which is something which is harder to do in the the text of, of the brief it, itself. Um, uh, and then I, I've seen in, in as an, an alternative to PowerPoint. And I've done this myself, and it depends upon your case. If you think you have a very strong case on the documents, and there are a few really really key documents that you want the tribunal to take home in a little packet, you can hand them a binder of the documents. Uh, and go through those documents one by one. Maybe there's eight, and you think these eight documents tell the entire story of this case. Uh, and then they go home with that, and they you know, keep that as you know, their, their collection of what you think are the, the key documents. I've seen that done very effectively, and you get around a little bit of the PowerPoint fatigue uh, doing that. Thank you. you have, yes, of course. I think completely agree with you all. Uh, and like... <coughs> PPTs, like, I always try to have, uh, I, I make a test in PPTs. Like, if you uh, need to spend more than 10 seconds to understand what's in the screen, it's it's a bad PPT. You need to change. So it's, it needs to, and text, like, don't work. You need to use for documents or for something that's very special in the case. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it's something that Mark said, it's very important. Uh, you need to have something that the arbitrators can take back to their home. So I think that that's in something that we do, and I think has been very effective in Brazil, is to have uh, the, the, the paperwork 
that's basically the PPT with some other uh, matters that are brought together. And of course, you need to deliver to the opposing party and to the, the arbitrators. And then they will, at the same time that you are presenting the case in your PPT presentation, they are taking notes in the same slides that you are talking about. So you take advantage of what you are showing, what you are speaking in their hearing, and the notes that they are taking. So uh, uh, that's that's something that's also uh, a practice that we we have done uh, a lot in Brazil. Thank you. So I think uh, we have some sort of consensus here that uh, opening statements are important, but they should be short to the point, um, and you should use powerpoints very carefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so moving on to closing closing arguments, and uh, let me start with this other side of the table now. Uh, Mark, how important, in your opinion, are closing arguments? Um, I, I agree generally with the comment made by Michael earlier that, that opening arguments tend to be more important than, than closing arguments. I also find that closing arguments, closing oral arguments, um, uh, tend to be very rare these days. Uh, you, 25 years ago, I think it was much more common, let's say, to have you know closing arguments, and then that was it, and then you'd get the decision from the tribunal. That's an extreme rarity, except perhaps in maybe smaller cases, fast-track uh, arbitrations and so forth. It's much more rare these days. I think it's redundant having closing oral arguments and post-hearing submissions. Uh, I don't care for that combination, unless there maybe is, is some, is, is some e exception. And closing arguments, usually on the last day of the hearing, sometimes there's a pause you know, for a day, and then you reconvene uh, because you have to go through the transcript and pull out the testimony and show to the tribunal what you proved, how how you advanced your case uh, through the examination of the witnesses uh, and and the experts. And that's basically it. It's uh, summarizing where your case was, what happened during the hearing, and how your case theory was advanced uh, during the hearing. Of course, both sides declare victory. Uh, during closing <laughs> arguments and, and post-hearing submissions. Um, but it, it does give you a chance to, for the tribunal, I suppose the advantage of, of oral post-hearing submissions is, again, it's live. And the tribunal now has sort of bathed in both sides' arguments for, for let's say, the full week. And they've generated more ideas and more questions in their mind. And they may not have been ready on day one to ask, you know, just the right pertinent question. But in the last, you know, in the final analysis, and then they have a day to go back and look at the record, and then they can come back and they can ask those questions that are really nagging them. The, you can also simulate that effect, and I find it to be very helpful for if there are no closing arguments and there are written post-hearing submissions, which is more or less the default uh, procedure these days. I do find it very helpful when the tribunal gives the parties guidance about what they would like to focus their submissions on. Otherwise, you very often, have, the parties are left to sort of think, well, you know, maybe they're not going to go back to the statement of claim and the statement of defense, the reply, the rejoinder. I better put it all in here. And you end up having a 300-page monster which regurgitates everything from beginning to, to end. Uh, and a lot of tribunals don't want that. And they say, please don't give me that. You can take it that we... we uh, We'll take your, your written submissions and your oral submissions uh, as, as understood, and I'd like you to focus on the following particular issues. I find it very helpful, again, because it gives both sides. First of all, it's, it's a due process issue. It gives them a full opportunity to understand what the tribunal is wrestling with and give a full opportunity to, to explain uh, their case. Uh, and again, to, to frame that question that they have within your broader case theory and advance your position, hopefully. Agree. Um, um, I don't like closing arguments immediately at the end of the hearing. It seems like two boxers raising their arms after a fight. So I don't think that it anyway, anyhow contributes uh, to consolidate the understanding of the tribunal about the case. I prefer uh, when we have a few days or weeks after the hearing ends, we have uh, an opportunity to present the oral uh, closing arguments, because arbitrators, lawyers, everyone had the opportunity to reflect upon the evidence that has been produced in the hearing. But uh, I must say that in Brazil, uh, post-hearing post written submissions are way more popular. 
uh, this is something that is cultural. This is what happens in our judiciary cases. So uh, they are way more popular. And uh, for many years, we have been experiencing uh, arbitrators telling the parties the questions they need, the arbitrators need to be answered in the briefings, which is quite useful. But of course, arbitrators should be uh, careful about it, not to be uh, perceived as, impar as partial by, by any of the parties. But in my opinion, it's quite helpful. Anything to add on this other side of the table, Michael? Uh, well, I've already given the game away. I'm not a fan of these <laughs> things. Um, I think the one thing that has been touched upon, but it's separate from oral closing submissions, which again, I, I, would, I would very, very rarely want to use, is to have the Q&A session with the tribunal okay. immediately after the hearing. I agree entirely with Mark. For guidance on the written post-hearing submissions, it's essential that the tribunal provide some structure and to identify the questions that are important to them. But what is sometimes useful is to have some time set aside at the end. And maybe there's, there's nothing uh, at that stage because the tribunal still need to consider these issues in more detail. But to have that immediate opportunity when everyone is together uh, to have a Q&A on the issues that are clearly of most concern to the tribunal. Because that in itself is useful because A, you're trying to dispel any misunderstandings or any concerns that they've got whilst it's still fresh in their mind and whilst they may be beginning the, the active process of deliberation. Uh, but it's also useful to you because by goodness, it gives you a good indication of where you need to focus on your PHPs as well at that point. But, but for me, oral closing submissions, you've either got a hearing which is short, in which case it's redundant because there's no point reminding somebody the evidence they heard two hours ago. Um, or frankly, after a long hearing, most people are punch drunk at the end of it yeah. and really do not want to sit there for another day having oral closing submissions. There's almost always, if you've got a long hearing, sufficient complexity and need to have written post-hearing submissions, which goes straight into Mark's redundancy point. And when you think about the phenomenal cost uh, to have every single person in the room for that extra day, um, I don't think it's an efficient or cost-effective uh, use of, of the client's money either. Uh, for, for that sake. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think Queen uh, 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 Q&A sections, uh, they are much more effective. Like we don't have, uh, like generally uh, speaking, uh, uh, closing arguments uh, in the hearings in Brazil. It's not uh, like by far our practice more uh, fan of uh, uh, written submissions, post hearing submissions. Uh, but I think that's, and, and the reason for that perhaps there's something to do with the training of the lawyers because uh, when you are, when I, 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 you see US and UK uh, lawyers uh, doing the cross examination during the hearing, you can see that they are preparing, then the, you are, they're telling the story through the questions that they are making to the, the, the witness and thinking how this story will be at the end of the hearing. So everything at least the way as we, 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 we see is focused on that. And that's not the way as we were training in, in, in Brazil, like we are building this international approach to, to the hearing and then now we are developing some uh, uh, techniques on that. Uh, but uh, in the end it's not, and for that reason I think it's not effective in Brazil because you are just summing up what happened and that's, that becomes uh, not not only not effective, but it's not something that the, the arbitrators will take advantage of. So I, I completely agree. Key and X actions would be very interesting. And of course, you will just address the main points in the Q and A sections and leave some room to the post hearing brief to answer the Q and A dash, uh, questions in their written post hearing submissions. Thank you. Anything else to add or I'm going to move on to second topic? Uh, I'll just one you quick do. comment uh, here, a, a pro tip. When you do have the Q&A session, and you very often hear the arbitrator say, now don't read anything into my question. <laughs> I, I, I'm not, haven't decided anything. Read everything into that question. It usually is that's the way they're thinking, and they're just testing their theory and want to make sure what the reaction of, of both yeah. sides is. So uh, be, be cautious when they say don't read anything in. Thank you. So our, our second topic for the day is witness preparation and cross-examination. And um, 
I think we're going to get into some cultural differences here, but um, let's see. <laughs> uh, and the first question is, how should a lawyer prepare a witness for a hearing in international arbitration? Uh, Michael, you want to start? Uh, thank you. Well, I mean, the topic itself gives rise to a range of different ethical and professional restraints. Um, and, and they are what they are. You can't do anything about those. Um, I think perhaps more interesting is what is the most effective way of uh, preparing a witness, at least in my perspective, and whether that uh, conflicts against anyone's particular professional requirements. I'm not a huge fan, I have to say, of American-style witness preparation because you can tell with the witness that they've been prepared. Mm -hmm. And an over-prepared <laughs> witness is, frankly, um, an unreliable witness and not a particularly credible witness. You know, it's a little bit like those sort of uh, visa interviews between a husband and a wife. And if both sides get exactly the right answer to every question in terms of the immigration, you know something is suspicious because everybody has a different recollection of events. And frankly, everyone can sometimes make mistakes. Um, and that's true in giving testimony too. So the perfect witness is, is often the imperfect witness in that regard. So for me, and this doesn't give rise to any ethical, I hope it doesn't give rise to ethical concerns, I'm not aware of it giving rise to any ethical considerations for me at least, is to have a three-stage, well, a maximum three-stage process for preparing a witness. And we would always, I would always do the first two, and the only question is for the third. Uh, the first is witness familiarization in the broadest sense of the word. These are the tribunal members. This is what the room will look like. This is where you'll be sitting. You know, don't forget to eat well beforehand. You know, you know, ask for a break if you need one. All of those very practical things you should always do. Because um, in much the same way as I think doctors make the worst patients, I think lawyers will make the worst witnesses. We just take too much for granted. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, then it is a strange and slightly terrifying process. Because for pretty well everybody, that only knowledge of giving testimony will have been what they've seen on television. And of course, the reality, particularly in arbitration, is remarkably different. So you have that basic level. Second point, which again, we would do in every case, is the familiarization of that witness with his or her testimony. And they have an opportunity then to correct what they may have made, you know, many mistakes or any errors or any clarifications, and the underlying documents. And you do that in a neutral way. You don't do it in a way of these are the points you must make. <laughs> these are the really important themes for you to develop. It's more to ensure that as far as possible, the documents that they're going to be presented with or the testimony that they will be giving is something that they're familiar with. Uh, and I think that's particularly true with our own witness statements, of course, because we always tell witnesses that their witness statement is, is their shield, effectively, that they will often have dealt with the answer to the question in their witness statement. And to have that reassurance that's in front of you, that's very helpful to them, very comforting. And the third point, which frankly I rarely do, but it's there, is the mock cross-examination. And that really is very witness specific and you can judge as to whether or not the witness needs that. But for me at least, that mock cross has to be an abstract case and we develop you know, abstract cases so they can understand the nature of cross-examination. I would never cross-examine a witness on the basis of the actual subject matter in a case because for me that gets close to coaching and irrespective of the ethical concerns about that, that's where you start getting the too perfect by half witness and you begin to lose, you chip away at the credibility when he or she ultimately gives testimony. So that's the approach I take and as I said, I sincerely hope that that satisfies my own ethical obligations. And uh, Gabriel, do you want to give us a view of how the process is in, in Brazil or in your experience? Yes. Um, uh, uh, many years ago, a labor court in Brazil ruled that lawyers could not talk the witness before the hearing, which is crazy. Of course, this was a sole precedent from a labor court, and uh, it didn't uh, alter our practice. Our practice is, of course, interviewing the witness, uh, in the preparation process, we cannot coach the witness or anyhow indicate which answers should be given to the tribunal. But we need, of course, to interview the witness and uh, see his or her uh, position on the facts. Uh, but I th think that uh, a great difference between the international practice and what we see in Brazil in many, in many cases is the lack of a written statement. 
uh, in Brazil, it's not unusual that you go to the hearing and uh, you only know in two or three lines what the witness brought by the counterparty will speak about. So it makes cross-examination so difficult because you need to uh, investigate with your client who is the witness, uh, what this witness might know because there was no deposition, so you didn't have the opportunity to talk that, to that witness. And then uh, you must uh, follow uh, the, the hearing and uh, take notes and then uh, create the, the, your line of interrogation at, that, at the same time or in real time when it's happening. So it's quite difficult. I myself, even when I sit as an arbitrator, I prefer to have the written, the written statement before the hearing. I think it's fair and uh, it's even a matter of due process. Had a quick word, uh, just very very briefly. Uh, you know, in, in the real estate market, they say the most important factors are uh, location, location, and location. I think similarly for for w witness uh, testimony, you could say the most important factors are credibility, credibility, and, and credibility. And it starts not just with the preparation, but with the selection of your witnesses. And a mistake that some lawyers make is to think, well, let's bring the CEO, let's bring the most senior person because they'll be very impressive to the tribunal, they're used to speaking to important people uh, like themselves. Uh, and then they show up. But first of all, it's very hard then to, to prepare them because they don't have time or they're not used to that sort of thing. And then they're certainly not used to being talked down to, let, let's say, by, by the lawyer who's controlling basically what they're able to say. Uh, and you can end up with some conflicts and someone who's basically giving their sort of politicized story instead of just the unvarnished truth. So it can backfire sometimes. And sometimes you're better off having the, the mousy engineer, n nothing against engineers, but someone who's maybe less... <laughs> Uh, you know, used to speaking to big audiences and they're not very, you know, political. They don't even know what the case is about. All they know is what they did in their job and they're just going to give their, their testimony truthfully. A lot of tribunals find that to be the most valuable because it just, you know, you see this person isn't capable of, of lying or even shading the truth. They're just testifying as truthfully as, as they can. And, um, just one follow-up question to you, Paulo. Um, is there a difference between let's say, Brazil and international arbitrations or U.S. or U.K.-based arbitration in, with respect to the weight that is given to witness testimony? Because I think Paul, uh, Gabriel has told us a few differences in, in preparation. What about the weight that the tribunals will give to a witness testimony? So echoing Mark's observation that um, in terms of the preparation for witnesses, we always tell the witnesses that they have the easiest job in the room that they only have to tell the truth, full stop. <laughs> That's it. They're not there to win the case. It's the lawyers that need to worry about that. They are there simply to tell the truth. And I think um, it's very easy, echoing what I said earlier, to underestimate the stress that witnesses are under. Because certainly in a big case, some of them may feel that they are responsible for what is quite a significant claim against the company. Um, and to get them to relax and not to feel like they are an advocate or part of the advocacy team is, is part of the skill. So there's there's some sort of pretty base psychology involved in that, but that's quite an important part. But the question to Paolo was much more interesting, so I let him answer <laughs> that. Uh, no, that that's... May, I, may I just one thing on this? <laughs> Actually, uh, in Brazil, we, we also have the challenge to show the witness that what will happen in that hearing is completely different from what uh, usually happens in uh, hearings at court. Sometimes they are used to hearings at court, but hearings at court take one hour, two hours, three hours for all the witnesses of the case. And uh, we, we, as you said, Michael, we need to stress that they must speak the truth because otherwise it will be found out by the arbitrators that it is not true. They will find so uh, it's uh, really important uh, to have this, not to lack the credibility of the witness and not having the, the, the witness sounding like a counsel for, to the party. Well, I, I will answer a question, but uh, uh, passing through, uh, I think, some points of these, because I think they're connected. Your question is very important uh, about uh, how different, uh, how is the... Uh, How's the about the weights that arbitrators in the end of the day give to Brazilian arbitrators and uh, U.S. U.K. arbitrators give to 
uh, the oral testimony of the witness and documents. And I, I think you are, uh, uh, as a, a Brazilian lawyer that is here for a long time, you, you, you went directly to the point that perhaps is one of the most important ones. Uh, the, in Brazil and Brazilian culture gives a lot of more credibility and weight to documents. And so when you have the witness being prepared, what we are mostly, uh, what the, the points that we are more concerned is to show to the witness the documents that are connected to their actions. So we spend a lot of time in the room showing the documents and reading the documents with the witnesses. Because I agree with you, some the best witnesses are not the CEOs, uh, are not the C levels of the companies in general. They are the guys who are like in in, in the performance of the agreements and the uh, directly involved in the construction of some building. And it's good to have these guys in the room, like showing the documents and and show. We are not showing the submissions. We're not showing the, but we are showing the documents and and making them to read that and to explain the documents to us. And that's a very, because and it, it, perhaps for you uh, here in the US, uh, uh, that's, that this would not even be the time prior to the hearing, because you have here the position practice, that you prepare that much earlier than the hearing. We, in general, don't have the position in Brazil. We don't have the position in Brazil at all, actually. And we have written statements, but we don't have the position. But then we are, when we are there preparing for the, the, the hearing, we show the documents to the witness. And then that's why when we are in the hearing examining or direct examining or cross-examining the witness, we pay so much attention to the documents and we put the documents in the screen and we go through the documents and show the documents both to the tribunal and to the witness. Because in the end of the day, what will be more compelling to the arbitrators will not be what the witness will say but the document itself, and how the document can be shown and can be interpreted for who wrote the document or what's the views of who made the documents to the to the uh, uh, to the tribunal. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the the uh, why uh, the way the Brazilian arbitrators give, not of course. Uh, 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 other jurisdictions, and I know that in UK, US, uh, the what the testimony, what the witness says, plays a much more important role than the documents itself. So, Michael, looks like you you want no, to. I, add I think something. it's because it's, it's, it's uh, we talk about cultural differences without really giving it much thought, and it's interesting having this debate, of course, and th thinking back to goodness knows the you know the hundreds of cases that we've been involved in. Um, you never lose your baggage. And I think if you grow up as an English lawyer, you grow up as a US lawyer, you grow up in the common law system, your entire training when you start out and the early parts of your practice, it's all in dispute resolution about witness examination. There's such important place on it. And you know, whether common lawyers are good or bad at this is a different thing, but you feel like you're trained to assess someone's credibility and honesty when they're giving testimony. And thinking back, I, I'm pretty sure that with all of the tribunals I've seen, those from common law backgrounds have always been more interested in what witnesses are saying than those from civil law backgrounds. Um, and absent the classic smoking gun document, and you know, I, we all wish we can find a smoking gun document in every case, but it hardly ever happens. Absent a smoking gun document, the problem with documents is that they can be nuanced or they can be explained or they can be ambiguous, uh, particularly emails. And it's the witness testimony that brings that to life. And it also exposes, I think, the underlying credibility of someone's case and the impetus behind those proceedings. If you have somebody bringing it to life for the tribunal and they can almost attribute the credibility of that witness to the credibility of the underlying case. Uh, for, for whom they are a witness. So I, I think that is actually one of those rare examples where cultural differences are important. Because for me, sitting as an arbitrator, what the witnesses say are critically important. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. So I, my follow-up question would be, would you then prepare a witness differently depending on your arbitral tribunal? If you have just civil law, countries, arbitrators, would you perhaps spend less time preparing witnesses because you because you know that they're going to focus more on the documents or 
or if you have, I don't know, if you have a common law, a tribunal that's composed of only common law arbitrators, which then focus more on witness preparation. No, I think in terms of the witness preparation, it'd be the same exercise. I think the impact, <coughs> for me at least, that would have is on cross-examination rather than on, on the ex preparation of your own witnesses for their examination in chief. Perfect segue to our <laughs> next topic then, <laughs> which is cross-examination. <laughs> um, I forgot which side. Well, Michael, why don't you continue then explaining to us how, how, do, how, to, how do you prepare for, for cross-examinating for cross a witness? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> It was interesting, uh, there's Gabrielle's observation about the difference between giving testimony in the Brazilian courts and in Brazilian arbitration, where it's see, much shorter in the courts than before arbitration. And in the common law system, it's the exact opposite, uh, where you can have some witnesses in you know, the equivalent size case before the, you know, the high court or the courts here, giving testimony for days or weeks. Uh, you know, a, a long cross-examination in arbitration would be a day or two days for a witness. And I think that's the mistake a lot of common lawyers make when it comes to cross-examination, particularly those that don't do arbitration exclusively, is that they try and do too much. Mm. Um, they start anticipating they've got all the time in the world, and of course they don't. So the key thing, of course, is to identify, going back to what I said earlier, the, the thing we always tell sort of law students, uh, w what are your good facts and what are your bad facts? <laughs> and how can you get this witness to you know, emphasize the former and, and to uh, mitigate the latter? Um, and that, for me, is the, the process of cross-examination, essentially, um, is to identify where are the key facts that this witness can help you with, uh, either positively or negatively. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the process itself um, usually is extraordinarily time-consuming in terms of preparing for cross-examination, um, largely because you've got to know their witness statement front ways and back ways. You've got to know it infinitely better than they do, for starters, but you also need to know intimately the documents. Um, that I get, gets, I suppose, to the next point as to how best you sketch that out, and I've seen uh, and we've all seen um, the list of questions which are sort of slavishly written down in terms of uh, what you anticipate you will ask. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. You can't do that because cross-examination is necessarily a very flexible thing. And you'd like to know what the answer you're going to get is, but you don't always get the answer you want. Um, so, so for me, my cross-examination is always, in terms of the preparation, a series of topics, broad outline questions. On one side of the page, you know, those sort of great English style sort of council's <laughs> notebooks, and on the, uh, on the other side of the page are your cross-references to all of the points, the documents, the bits of testimony that you think will contradict the likely answer that that witness will give. You know, you say now X, but and then you go back to whatever the document is or something like that. So it's a plan that has to have structure, but it's also a plan that necessarily needs to be fluid. And that's why cross-examination is hard. It's, it's not an easy skill to do because uh, you can't let it degenerate. And I know we'll talk about some of the things in a moment uh, into, a, into a battle between you and the witness. You need to control the witness um, and do it in a way which is civil. Um, there may be differences which we'll get onto because I think you can deal with experts in a slightly less civil way as you can with a fact witness. Uh, but that's that's for a, a, f a future discussion in a few moments, I suspect. And um, one follow. Oh, I'll, I'll, let me ask this other side of the the table um, a question that that I have following up following up from uh, what Michael just that's said. Is, is. Um, what is not? I don't want to say the best approach, but what would you recommend? Would you recommend going through? And making sure you address every single fact or all all all, all of the points that the witness has made in the written written testimony, or do you favor more of a shorter cross examination that only goes to you know you know the points you you want to make before the tribunal and um yeah Mark <laughs> sure I I shouldn't I certainly wouldn't advocate uh, as as a, an automatic or default position going through each of the statements that the witness has made because then the the witness and the lawyers on the other side who help prepare the witness statement are essentially guiding what the content is and even the order of your examination so I think you're much more selective and you think about which topics you want to cover 
and they may not be even within the scope of the witness statement itself. Most tribunals say as long as it's relevant to this witness testimony, they have relevant evidence, they may deliberately have avoided talking about a topic, right, which might be the richest vein to tap uh, something that they should have addressed that they didn't address. So definitely don't use that as uh, as your your outline or your guidepost of the topics that you're, you're going to cover or the order uh, that you're going to cover. Um, I would say, I mean, cross-examination is a vast topic, but one, one, one point that I think is helpful to keep in mind is that there are very different styles to cross-examination. Uh, very often the witness statement is going to be very different from the live witness that you have in front of you. Uh, you know, the witness statement looks like you're going to be dealing with a wolf and then a lamb shows up and they're a completely different uh, person. Or it's a, it's a wolf and lamb's uh, clothing. Uh, but, but, but you need to adapt your style to them, right? You don't want to be harassing them or abusing them, especially in front of a, a civilian tr tribunal that, that doesn't uh, take kindly to that very often. But there are different styles. So you, you, you might do what's called sort of a constructive uh, cross-examination, where the witness is actually quite um, pliable, uh, and, and, uh, and you can take the tribunal through a series of documents using this witness and teaching the tribunal how these documents and how this story connects. And the, and the witness is very happy to follow along with you. Uh, other times you might do what's called a destructive uh, or impeachment, you'd say, uh, style cross-examination, where you're undermining the the credibility of the witness. I think a very common error is to have a bias more towards impeachment and to think, oh, you're going to prove to this tribunal that this person is a liar. And that almost always backfires. It almost is very hard to do that. And I think the tribunal also doesn't like that. You might just uh, more subtly show that they're... they're uh, their memory uh, is not uh, is not very reliable, right? They weren't really there uh, for the, for the critical scene, uh, or they weren't uh, you know an important participant in a particular event, um, or uh, you know, or they're biased in some way. And you don't need to do it so overtly, but you can just tell the tribunal that they have certain relations with certain parties. They've been you know associated with with a certain view for a long time, and of course that they're going to uh, adhere to hew to that, that, that line of thinking. So the much more subtle ways of undermining credibility, I would say. Um, Gabrielle? Yeah, oh. Oh. yeah just uh, like, I, I, I think what's the most important about cross-examination is uh, knowing that it's not your show. It's, it's not something that you wanna, you are not there to, uh, to, to show that you are the best cross-examiner. You are there to show what are the facts and how that witness is either telling the truth or lying. So and sometimes take out of the witness, even the, the witness that is being cross-examined, facts that can be helpful to your case. And uh, that's something that in, in, in civil law countries, in Brazil particularly, uh, the arbitrators sometimes, they get to understand that they are the protectors of the witness. And if you engage in a battle with the witness, in the end of the day, you are engaging in a battle with the arbitrators, what definitely you don't want. And so I'm always very careful for like, independent of the cross-examination that you are doing, you don't want to like become the enemy of the witness. You want to take out what's the best from there. And sometimes you want to like engage in a very civilized conversation like, and then you can take something very interesting for a case. Some, some, sometimes we we gain more from the other side's witness than from our own witness. And but that's like something about the way of crossing. But uh, about the preparation for cross examining, uh, there is an interesting fact. Uh, some uh, some years ago, I invited a, a very uh, good uh, br uh, U.S. practitioner to go to Brazil and teach us how to prepare and how to conduct uh, cross-examination uh, in Brazil. And he spent like almost two hours explaining the techniques and how you should be careful about uh, going to the, the lines of the witness statements and so on. And, and then like someone in, in the room, uh, Brazilian practitioner asked, uh, raised his hand and said, and asked, well, but when we don't have uh, witness statements, and the, 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 the guy said, well, you go to the deposition. Well, but it, we don't have the position. <laughs> and 
so, and then the, the guy, well, but then there's no solution. Like you need to have either one or other to be prepared. No, that's how that Gabriel said in the beginning, like in the end of the day, if in Brazil, the Brazilian practice is like only preparing through the documents of the case, uh, uh, witness statements is something new for Brazilian practice, like something that has been brought to Brazil through international arbitration, like in the last 15 years, I would say. Uh, so uh, it's uh, again getting back to the point about how the importance of documents in persuade in being persuaded to the tribunal. Gabriel, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, we need to be very careful during cross examination. The witness should shine and lawyer should fade. Um, and uh, I think that uh, in Brazil, those techniques. Uh, applied in international arbitration, they only spread in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, nowadays, we have very well-prepared lawyers to conduct cross-examination, but uh, being someone who, who graduated in the previous century, I'd say that it's kind of novelty for us. Um, we, we need to establish this connection with the witness. We need to be polite. Uh, it's very difficult, but we need to create some trust of the witness and make the witness feel comfortable. And uh, something that Mark said is very important. We should not use the witness statement as a guide and go through all points of it. Otherwise, you give, you give your opponent a great opportunity for making a great redirect examination and stress all the points to the arbitral tribunal. Thank you. And um, we're kind of running short of time, so I'm going to jump to the, our third topic, which is which we addressed a little bit, and it's the arbitral tribunal's participation. And and I think we we we're sort of a consensus here that it's it, it's very helpful when the tribunal asks questions or or there's a Q and A session or some sort of questions at the end of the hearing. But um, one one question that I want to ask is whether it's helpful to have arbitrators be more proactive, maybe leading up to the hearing in in in, uh, in, in shaping the what's gonna the procedures, shaping what's gonna happen at the hearing, and um and um and then my question is: Is it should should arbitrators and is it helpful if the tribunal before the hearing, tells the party what points they wish to be addressed at the hearing or try to narrow the issues, or, or perhaps the tribunal say they know everything they, there is to know, they, they, they're going to rule on the papers, they don't need a hearing. Is that too much intervention? Who should control what happens at the hearing? Is it, should it be more in the tribunal or the parties? And um, I, forgot, I forgot which side of the table I should be... <laughs> Looking at now, Mark, do you want, do you want to start with this one? Sure. sure. Um, I, I, I find that um, it's fairly rare for a tribunal to give guidance before the hearing about the topics that they want to hear about. And it may just be for the practical reason that they haven't read into the file sufficiently. They are just come from another hearing, arbitrators at the highest level, very, very busy, uh, obviously. They may have just come from another hearing days before, and they're still reading into the file, and they haven't had the chance to actually formulate you know, the, the key questions. And then there's also, Gabrielle, I think you, you mentioned it, there's the concern too about you, giving the impression that you've prejudged, you know, some, some issues too, particularly at that, at that early stage. I find it's helpful, uh, as I mentioned, hearing questions during opening presentations or at the end of the opening presentation, sometimes our tribunal will sort of signal a few issues that they would like to have more, uh, more information on. And I find that, that to be very helpful. One, one of the downsides to the adversarial system uh, with the cross-examinations is it can sometimes be very inefficient, right? And particularly if you have cross-examiners that, you know, may, maybe again come from the common law system who are less acquainted with international arbitration and they think, oh, I, I'm going to do a six-hour examination. A lot of that can be a real waste of time for the tribunal, which is sitting there anxiously thinking, these are the things I need to understand in order to write my award. Uh, and so you do see tribunals sometimes say, and I find it helpful, 
I think we have enough on that topic. I think you know we understand that topic very well. Let's move on to to another one. Uh, I think that's that's very helpful, and, and I definitely uh, welcome that from tribunals because you're not if you're not quite sure whether you've, you've rung the bell, whether you, they've really got it. If they say we got it, then you know you can move on and uh, and use the time more efficiently. Yes, um, I totally agree. Uh, arbitrators should interrupt when they are satisfied with what has been said about a certain point. Um, I like when arbitrators interfere. However, arbitrators should be aware that lawyers have been, have been through a long process of preparing to the hearing. <laughs> and uh, I think that arbitrators uh, should have uh, the feeling of the proper time to interfere not to, uh, for example, having a cross-examination uh, made into a tumult because of so many stops and questions and so on. Uh, I myself, I like when arbitrators ask questions, uh, not only to read them, as uh, Michael said, but also uh, because they, they are the ones who need to be convinced. So they must uh, make questions. However, if they could sometimes uh, restrain, restrain their anxiety and wait for the end of the cross-examination to make the, that, the, those questions, I think that it's more productive. Michael? Uh, thank, uh, to some extent, I suppose there's, a, there's an artificiality to the question as to what role or whether the tribunal should have a role in shaping the hearing, because of course they always do. Um, in most cases, there will be disagreements between the parties about the way in which the hearing should look, and they have to decide it one way or another. <laughs> so to that extent, they have an active role in shaping the hearing. Uh, the real issue, I suppose, is if the parties agree that the hearing should be X, is it incumbent on the tribunal to say, no, it should be Y? I think that's going too far. I think if the parties agree that there is a particular way they want to run a hearing, if the tribunal think that's inefficient, they can make the point, but ultimately they should be there to give guidance, not to give directions uh, in terms of overruling the parties. Um, but stepping back and sort of echoing the points from, from Mark uh, and from, from Gabriel, I always think that you know, there's, there's an element of an arbitration hearing which is a bit like a theater production, where uh, we, counsel, are the actors. Um, but the tribunal are unusual to the extent that they have two roles. They're both the audience, but ultimately they're the critics. These are the people that will write the final review. And you need, going back to all of the similar points we've made during the course of this, you're doing it not to look good before your clients, even though that's nice. Um, you're doing this case to win. And the only way you're gonna win is if you're presenting to the tribunal what they want to hear, what they're really interested in. And if you're ignoring that, if you're blind or, or deaf, whatever it is, to what they're interested in, then you're doing your case and your clients a disservice. So I think to the extent that the tribunal give the sort of indications that Mark mentioned and Gabriel mentioned, then you should be very mindful to assist them on, on those points and to give them what they want, whether that's in terms of a substantive issue or a procedural matter, um, and be, be respectful of them because they're ultimately, you know, the people that matter. Yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's, uh, in, I think it's very helpful to have like the questions from the tribunal, <laughs> but uh, since they are like in a worse off position in terms of knowing the case, previously from the, the hearing, uh, something that has become very popular in Brazil, uh, like in the, in, in recently, <laughs> is uh, having an early presentation of the case to the tribunals. To the tribunal. So uh, in like in the first, uh, just after the first submissions, you have uh, 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 an early presentation of the case to the, the tribunal, and then you, you finish the, the submissions, and then you get, you have the the the, uh, the hearing, uh, probably with another presentation and the cross the examination of the witness, because this allows the tribunal to have a sense of what is the case on the perspective of the parties, and then submit questions previously to the hearing. Then uh, you can have 
like the best of the two worlds, knowing what the arbitrators really want to know and being sure that you have already given them the, the, the path to, to understand the case. The road, roadmap that uh, 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 Michael said that I think it's, it's very, very critical to, to being successful. Does, uh, I, have, I actually have a question on that. Does that um, pre-hearing hearing in, in Brazil, does, does it happen in every case or is it just a, or is it a step for the tribunal, for example, to decide whether it wants its own, to appoint its own expert or to decide what, what more evidence it needs or, or is it now, has it now become a standard practice that is, there, there are always two hearings in, in arbitrations in, in Brazil? I wouldn't say that's a standard practice. It started uh, in cases where you had, and that's very common in Brazil, as you know, uh, a, a preliminary, uh, uh, an interim measure that was initiated previous to the arbitration, then the arbitration of, like that was given uh, by the courts, and then the arbitration, the, the arbitration tribunal will uh, ratify that, need to ratify that decision, and then you have the opportunity to bring the case earlier. But this became so good, and like it's just, it became so uh, uh, successful in terms of giving the arbitration the arbitra tribunal the sense of what's the case, then we started doing that uh, as like, a routine, like in, including the terms of reference, a, a previous uh, presentation of the case. At some point, it, it can be like just after the the the, uh, the response or the uh, the reply. If you have like red frame schedule just before the red frame schedule uh, uh, a time, then you can uh, uh, show the tribunal why some documents that are on the possession of the opposing party are important to the case. So I think and. Then you have like a, a connection between the parties and the tribunal in an early stage of the case. Um, Mark, have you seen this in, in the arbitrations you've, you've worked uh, Yeah, I, I, I confess I'm less familiar with the pre-hearing <laughs> hearing uh, um, technique, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily object to it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it brings up the point that that uh, in international arbitration, very often there's a default to uh, you know a, a type pattern, right, in organizing the the proceedings, and that tribunals really do have the flexibility to to craft the the proceeding in a way that makes sense for for a particular case, and if it does make sense uh, in conjunction with uh, an early organizational hearing to hear a little bit on the merits of the case and and uh, and and you know have the uh, tribunal more engaged in what really is coming down uh, uh, the the road. Um, I, I could definitely see the the, the benefit to, to doing that. I mean, I certainly wouldn't uh, think that that's that's unusual. And I think that the mechanism of arbitration is certainly flexible to to accommodate uh, that that kind of procedure. Uh, actually, these uh, pre-hearing hearing. It's somewhat similar to uh, to that technique called the Kaplan opening. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to uh, I've have um, heard from many arbitrators that it's a good opportunity to see on the parties and counsel's eyes right in the beginning of the case and uh, to establish a way of working with them. Uh, it's not, as Paulo said, standard practice right now but it's becoming more and more popular. I've seen this no, uh, mostly uh, in uh, corporate and M&A cases, which typically uh, commence with requests for interim measures in courts. So uh, the parties are already in a fierce litigation when the arbitrator starts. So uh, I think that it's something interesting. I wouldn't say that would be my... Uh, cup of tea in every case, but sometimes it's really helpful. Michael, I think I heard you said you're, you're terrified of... <laughs> <laughs> not, not terrified, horrified uh, in that sense. No, I, I think it depends what it is, of course, because if, if you're talking in terms of a pre-hearing hearing, sort of the classic pre-hearing CMC, that is perfectly standard. I know we're going to have a few words on that in a moment, but the, the danger in all of this is if you start getting into the substantive merits of the party's arguments early on, before, perhaps in this case, it depends when the pre-hearing hearing, if the, if the submissions are already in, there are no further submissions, no further witness testimony, 
that might be acceptable to some extent, but it also presupposes that the tribunal have fully reviewed everything. It demands a very well-prepared tribunal. And if the purpose of that session, as you described, is simply for the tribunal to identify those areas that are of most interest to them at the hearing, without limiting without limiting the parties' arguments to address anything else, you know, the usual formula, then that's that's fine. Um, I, I'd still be a little wary, though, of the concerns that the tribunal are exhibiting a little bit too much of their view of the merits of the case before it actually starts. And I know it's a fine line because you might ask, well, if they're asking questions in the opening of the actual hearing, not the pre-hearing hearing, or they're not doing the same thing, maybe they are. It's a subtle difference. But the emotional reaction, particularly for, for the parties to hearing this before the hearing even starts, may begin to undermine the sense of, of confidence they have in the tribunal, potentially. <clears throat> Well, moving on to our last topic, which is somewhat somewhat related and is the the actual pre-hearing conference, not not a pre-hearing hearing. hearing. <laughs> um, let me ask Gabriel, what what do what needs to be decided at a pre-hearing conference, and how 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 has your experience been? Well, uh, we've been doing this in Brazil for a long time. I think it's really important. Uh, we need to decide things from a schedule. Uh, should the witness be available all the week long or just for a few days? What do we do if there is enough time each day and so on? I think that is the organizational opportunity of the hearing. Um, arbitrators should be very careful not to anticipate what they think on the case, of course. And I think that this should be uh, more about, I mean, only about procedural and formal aspects of the case. I think that these hearings should take place as soon as possible, as soon as the written submissions are concluded and, uh, evidence and documentary evidence has been produced so that the parties can organize themselves to what they expect. In my experience, not all, uh, not all questions are decided in this conference or even in the days after the conference, sometimes, for example, you had you have a request for a hot tubbing, and then the tribunal says, okay, no taken, but we will decide during the hearing. However, I think that uh, as many issues we could have de decided at this time, it would be better for the case, for the predictability of the hearing. So, sorry, so you mentioned... Did you mention allocation of time? Yes, allocation of time. Uh, how time shall should be uh, should be measured? Will it be a chess clock uh, system and so on? Court reporters, uh, audio, uh, video, <laughs> everything should be uh, catering. Everything should should be discussed at that time. But there are some some aspects that can be decided later, as you mentioned, hot yes. tubbing. Yes, if the tribunal is not... Oh, sorry. Um. If the tribunal at that very moment is not comfortable with uh, granting some or denying some requests, I think that the tribunal should postpone the decision on them. I think it's quite fair. Sometimes we don't know if uh, a certain type of evidence will be needed at the end of the hearing. We, uh, this is very dynamic. So uh, we should have, as I said, as many decisions as, as possible, but sometimes they're not feasible. Exactly. Thank you. Any deferring views? Anything to add on this side of the table? Paulo? Well, other than I think for most of us now, the pre-hearing CMC is often a bit of a damp squib because a lot of these points have been identified, sometimes even in procedural order number one. Um, it, w w the, throwing my mind back to the more recent CMCs I've had, the debates, putting to one side all the practical stuff about you know, making sure that the tribunal feel they've got a nice enough room for deliberations and the rest, um, it, it's really been two points, both of which are relatively unexciting and sterile. 
One is the seemingly eternal question as to what a demonstrative exhibit is, which for me is remarkably easy, but it re revolves around the most extraordinary collection of opinions as to what a demonstrative is, and mostly they're wrong, but in any event, there's a debate about that. Uh, and also about sometimes witness sequestration, and, and in particular, the, the idea of witness sequestration is not unusual. I think it, it's proper, but the, again, what is a tiny but seemingly constant point as to whether witnesses can appear before the tribunal in the oral opening arguments. And I've no idea why that's a point of debate, because if they can read the submissions, they can attend the oral opening arguments. But be that as it may, I have to say my experience is that most pre-hearing CMCs now last about 30 minutes, and most of that is introductions. I think that, that uh, I think that they are very important. The CMS, like, and, and particularly uh, now that we have technology and virtual hearings, and some of the witnesses uh, are uh, uh, examined like from distance, and so I, I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, but again, you see how important cultural difference, uh, the role of cultural difference, uh, for and I, I had this uh, issue about having the witness, uh, factual witness in the room during the, 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 the oral presentations uh, of the parties. And like for me, for a uh, civil law practitioner, it was like completely uh, 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 in, in, uh, inadmissible to have the, the factual witness, witness like following what the, the lawyers would, how they would present the case. So, and, and, but, and in that case, it was in the UK, uh, the, the opposing party and the arbitrator like were like, wow, that's uh, uh, that's the way as it is. Like it's th this is normal. So uh, again, like it's always about this uh, cultural uh, difference uh, because like in Brazil, it's like we you never see a factual witness uh, since uh, like the factual witness will be appear only when it's her or his time to be examined and uh, cross examined. And then it, it should not be uh, uh, able to talk with the other witness, like in, with anyone else, uh, about the case. And the, but the expert witness, they are allowed to be there since the beginning. And then, so uh, I think it's, that, that's also uh, an important matter. Thank you. And, and now with the last round of questions, and we've discussed all the you know, do's and don don'ts and what rules you, you need to establish, what rules you don't need to establish. And I just want to know, I want to finish this panel with everyone telling us a, a war story of something that went wrong in one of the, your hearings and how you address the situation. And what do you do now to prevent that this will ever happen again? Uh, and I'll start with Gabriel. Well, uh, if I may, Tell a story of something that went right in the hearing. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you never had anything gone wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Actually, um, I was in a hearing a few years ago, and uh, I was uh, examining the founding controlling shareholder of a company. And uh, this company accused my client of um, breaking a contract. Uh, which was expected to last years and years and years. And we said that we had the right to walk out of the contract at any time. But they, uh, they uh, tried to establish that my client had created the expectation, the legitimate expectation that the contract would be enforced for a long time. And uh, the example they gave was that... Uh, this controlling shareholder would have granted personal guarantees uh, to secure credits of my clients, uh, debts of my clients. But I know it was totally wrong. It was not true. And then uh, after uh, this uh, witness gave a very emotional uh, testimony, uh, we just went to the documents. Please open this contract. Is this a contract you said is a personal guarantee? Yes. Please go to last page. Okay. Where is your signature? Well, I cannot find it. So that's it. <laughs> Just two questions. Very simple. Their case was over. <laughs> <laughs> make, make sure you have the signed contracts when you're putting together the witness statements. Um, Michael? 
Uh, well, I mean, in terms of disasters, all of mine have involved technology. Um, and that was even before COVID, where most of our hearings, of course, were, were virtual with video conferences with witnesses and everything. And that early sense of well, arrogance, maybe, because I remember my first virtual hearing uh, sitting at home, and it was May 2020. And um, yeah, I'm not a teenager, so I, I thought that the Wi-Fi that I had installed in my, I was living in Paris at the time, my apartment, was at the time cutting edge. It was the best that SFR or was Orange or whatever it was could offer. And so I geared myself up for the hearing, sitting in my office at home. And uh, it started, and I kept on not realizing myself that I was freezing. Um, and of course, I was remarkably arrogant, saying, no, I've got fantastic Wi-Fi. Um, it was only subsequent that I realized I had sort of uh, basically eight years out of date Wi-Fi, uh, which meant that that three day hearing was a very slow three day virtual hearing because every third word I said was largely fractured and broken eye. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, what did I do to change that? I just got better Wi-Fi for the next hearing, as easy as that. Um, but no, technology usually creates problems. But the, the weirdest in terms, this isn't so much what went wrong, but the oddest thing I've ever been involved in in a hearing is I've been involved in a series of cases involving uh, one particular client's uh, interest in a, in a specific country. And this is an oil and gas case, and they had various interests in different parts of this country, and each of those created a dispute. And they were all heard separately, but it was the same team on both sides. And we were in the final hearing of uh, one of those cases where the award came through for another of those cases, uh, which is an unusual situation in itself, but it meant that we were sitting there and it was a, the other side were cross-examining a minor witness, that we could see them they were just sitting basically where Gabriel is, reading the award in exactly the same circumstances and exactly the same time that we were. And I'm pleased to say that we, we won on everything. We defeated all of their claims. We won on all of ours. And to have the opportunity to see your counterpart's face <laughs> as they are reading the award is, I think, unique and priceless. I don't think I'm ever going to experience that again. Um, but that was that was certainly probably my career highlight so far. <laughs> no, well, some, something that, that I, I, I experienced that was interesting that was that like we were like in a cross examination and then we were talking about an email with a witness and then we, we discussed it with and the witness brought everything about the email and the email was on the screen. Mm -hmm. And and then we got what we wanted from the, the witness. And then the witness went away, and then the next witness came. And before showing the email in the screen, I started making questions about that email. And the main part, the main participants of that email, who wrote that email, was the second witness. Mm -hmm. And then this particular witness said, X. And then I asked the witness if she or he had already said X about that topic. And the witness said, well, I've, I've never seen anything connected with that topic. So the witness was like, like lying, like expressly lying. Then like, I, I was uh, in, very engaged in that case. Like this was probably the fifth day of hearing. And then I was with a pen in the, in, in the hand and I, like, I, <laughs> I, I threw the, the hand in the, the, the pen in the, in, the, in the floor saying, tribunal. I'm sorry, but I don't need to say anything. This witness is lying. I, I don't know how you can you want to deal with that. So because like it was so clear. And then like, of course, like a, it was like both intentional and non-intentional um, anger. But uh, it was important to show that the, the, the witness was, was lying. And then after that, like we showed the screen and the, the witness just answered exactly what we wanted. And, and then it, it went on. So but I think it was this. Uh, in, intentional, if I was to change, I would just uh, 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 show the no intentional, the intentional parts of the anger, not the no intentional part of the anger. But <laughs> <laughs> Mark? Um, uh, trying to think of, of, of war stories. You know, one common war story I hear, I, I haven't really had this experience myself, but one common war story you hear, which raises very difficult issues, is what happens when your witness gets up and goes off the reservation completely? And so you've been talking to this person in preparation. 
Uh, you think you understand who they are and what their testimony is, and then they get up, and then maybe they testify in a way that you think is untruthful. And then what do you do in, in that situation? I think that's a very difficult issue to, uh, to, to grapple with. And so many war stories I, I suppose I would have, but one, one that comes to mind is at a hearing in Geneva maybe about 12 years ago. We had there was an issue over the licensing of some of some technology that was subject to patents, and we had an expert a German gentleman who was in his mid eighties or even a little uh, older, but very very sharp, and he was our expert. And between the time of his last expert report and the hearing, he had fallen ill, and was taking um, uh, uh, chemotherapy and I think some experimental drugs. And he showed up, and my my. Um, associate was was preparing him and came in to me and said uh, Houston we have a problem uh, the man doesn't even understand his own his own expert report uh, and so I came in I talked to him we chatted for a little while and sure enough he he uh, was just not lucid at all and maybe it was temporary because of the medication or maybe it was something more more permanent I don't know but we had to go to the other side first and explain the the situation. Uh, to their great credit, they didn't think we were trying to pull a, a fast one and pull our witness, uh, pull our expert, because we'd lost confidence in him. The tribunal under, was very understanding as well. And what the solution was is we, we gave uh, what was called a proffer of evidence, uh, where the... Uh, where we essentially gave a, a speech about what he would have accomplished at the hearing if he had testified. And then the other side uh, gave their own proffer in which they uh, gave their dream cross-examination and, and how that would have gone. And I think that was the best solution that we could come up with uh, in, in, the, in the circumstances. That's an interesting way to deal with it. Um, well, I, w I want to thank our hosts, Quinn Emanuel, and our panelists. This was a very interesting talk, and uh, I hope everyone watching it on Canal uh, Arbitragem enjoys it. And um, thank you very much. Thank you.